So you're Canuck, eh? I'm from Newfoundland. You know the the scene, the scene of the <laughs> okay. scene of the crime, man. You know. I was taught to to. You probably will have to bleep this, but I was taught how to speak Newfie. Go on, give it to me. All right. You, it's three words, three random words. Yeah. Uh, beef, oil, like from the ground, and hooked, like you've hooked a fish, but you have to say them in the right order. Oil, beef, hooked. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that as whale oil beef hooked. Whale oil beef hooked. Whale oil beef hooked. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being here. It's lovely to meet you. Yeah, it's nice to meet you too. You know, we did a couple of our t Titanic expeditions out of St. John's. Oh, yeah. Did you spend much time there? A fair bit, you know, at the beginning and at the end, because you, you got to set up the ship and get it all. We painted an entire Russian ship there, a uh, 450 foot ship in, in St. John's from end to end. Wow. Just as you do. Yeah. It's a very it's a very Canadian story in a lot of ways. I mean, it sinks, sinks off the coast of, of Newfoundland. They're, they're buried yes. in, a, in a Halifax uh, cemetery. That's right, um, in Nova Scotia. Yeah. And, the, and the Marconi station that they were communicating with uh, is right there on a hill above St. John's, which is a very important link in the whole, the whole story. Signal Hill. It's where we would go and make uh, out when we were in high school. I will have to take your word for that. You will have to. What was what was the germ of the idea in the first place? Like what like like why the Titanic and then? Like what 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 was the Well, it was never a big thing for me as a kid. I know a lot of especially especially boys are fascinated by the story growing up and all that. I was never fascinated by it particularly. What happened for me was when the wreck was discovered by Robert Ballard. I saw a video on TV of the little robot, Jason Jr., that he used to go and explore in, in down in the Grand Staircase of the Wreck. And I thought, that's inner space. That's like science fiction. That's cool stuff. And so I wrote about it and made a movie called The Abyss, yeah. right, about remotely operated vehicles and all that kind of technology in the process of which I met Robert Ballard. And he showed me around in his labs and the vehicles he was developing. And, you know, he was obviously famous for finding and exploring Titanic. And that then lodged in the back of my mind. So I make the abyss, I make Terminator 2. And then after Terminator 2, I'm looking for something to do. And I start thinking about all that inner space technology and wanting to do a science fiction story. And then I thought, what about Titanic? So I started looking at the history, which I knew nothing about. And I, uh, I looked at uh, Night to Remember, the famous black and white film from the early 60s, right? And uh, I thought, wow, this is an amazing story. It's really heart-wrenching. It's really, you know, uh, it's really tragic. And I thought, tragic love story, Romeo and Juliet, put it against that background. Mm -hmm. And it just popped. It just popped into my head like that. I tell you what was interesting was getting to read, getting ready for this interview was going back and reading all the press because I was born so I was born in in eighty seven so I was a kid when this book came when this when this film came out right so right, all all right. I know of Titanic is it being a massive film and all of us lining up to buy the double VHS at the, the store yeah, right. like yeah, yeah yeah the stack right? yeah <laughs> yeah everyone had the, the stack right when I was yeah. reading um, the press about Titanic right before it came out I learned something new which was that, and this is not news to you, but I'll, I'll say it to everybody anyway. Uh, it was kind of already being talked about. There was talk that it wasn't going to work out. There was talk that it was going to be a flop. There was talk yep. that it was going to be, it was already becoming the most expensive movie movie ever made. It was like being compared to the actual Titanic, which cost all this but, money. Yeah, you know? and, wa yeah. and Waterworld, it's like anything with water, yeah. soggy, film sinks film is doomed as the as the liner itself you know i mean i i can remember all these headlines they had us you know toes up in a ditch before they'd ever seen a foot of film which yeah. was the most amazing thing to experience you can imagine to have everybody in the world kind of you know betting against you like you're the biggest chump in history i i kept a razor blade taped to the edge of the screen of my avid workstation when i was editing the film and it, it with a little note on it that said use in case film sucks. <laughs> so hold on. So are you feeling any of that stuff really though? Like are you feeling like oh I, th this might not work out. This might be this might be it for me. Are you are you kidding? I mean, I we were convinced and by we I mean myself and the producer John Landau. We were convinced that we were never going to work in Hollywood again. It was done. It, you know, I had a nice run, didn't work out. Up until the first time we screened the movie for an audience, which was in Minneapolis in, I think, June 
of 97. So still a few months before he released the film. And at that moment, when I heard the audience response, and there was a woman sitting behind me that just literally narrated the whole movie from her perspective. Oh, you, you say you don't like him. You say you don't like him, but you're holding on to his hand now, aren't you? <laughs> you know? And, uh, and I thought, wow, this movie really works. Maybe it's not a disaster, you know? Yeah. And then as we got closer to the, to the release, the story kind of burned itself out when we moved out of summer to Christmas. The, the, all the negative stuff burned itself out. And then people just were left with nothing. But all right, fine. Let, let's look at this thing. Yeah. Let's look at this three-hour turd, yeah. you know? And then they watched it and they went, oh, my fucking God. Yeah. It's not what we said. Yeah. And so then they didn't have that other story. They had a new story. A new story was, it's pretty good. Yeah. But we still thought we probably wouldn't work again because we thought we had burned through $200 million on a, on a flop, yeah. a good flop. At least now we knew it was a good flop. Then it came out right before Christmas and it went up. It didn't go down. You know, movies go down 40, 50, 60 percent on their second weekend. It's just a thing. It's like a law of gravity. We didn't go down. We went up. Yeah. Movies don't go up. You know, that's like it's like an unwritten law. Was there a moment you knew that not, this wasn't just going to do OK? You were going to be OK. You, you were going to be able to work again. This was maybe going to recoup. <laughs> was there was there a moment where you were like, oh, my God, actually, this might become the highest grossing film of all time, like that kind of thing? It was a series, a cascading series of kind of revelations to all of us. So there were two studios involved, Paramount, Paramount and Fox, yeah. and you know ourselves at Lightstorm. And just week after week, it got weirder and weirder and weirder, you know, until we just kind of woke up one morning at the toward the end of January and said, "Guys, you understand we're on a trajectory to be the highest grossing film ever." Unless something really weird happens, you know, really disruptive happens in the next month. And everybody just stopped and, and, and they kind of realized what was happening. Um, but we, it was almost impossible to believe up until that moment. And then it played out. That's exactly what happened. So it was a pretty crazy time to go from the depths of despair yeah. to the height of triumph, you know. I wanted to ask you something that it's, it's been in the news recently, but like I always knew it as East Coast lore, like coming from Newfoundland. I had heard this urban legend growing up and I've heard it in the news recently. I wanted to ask you about it, which is the story that like while you were filming in Dartmouth and Nova Scotia, the chowder got yeah. laced with PCP. This is true. This is a hundred percent true story. Let me tell you, you haven't lived until you've been high on PCP, which by the way, I do not recommend to anyone, even stoners. <laughs> There was a little tiny hospital in, I think it was uh, Dartmouth, um, with like 85 crew members. Yeah. You know, so the hospital, I mean, there was an emergency room with no one in it and like a nurse and 85 crew members walk in. You know, we don't know. We think we've had shellfish poisoning, like, you know, uh, uh neural shellfish poisoning that kills you like you know and and uh we oh. walk in we don't know what's going on and basically somebody had taken a pound of pcp and dumped it into the chowder why and we have a pretty strong suspicion who it was uh although it was never proven um we believe the story is that it was somebody who had a beef with the caterers because the first thing we did was fire the caterers right when we recovered you know the next day um and, uh, you know, sure enough, we had some we had some leads on that. Of course, the operant theory was that I was such a psychomaniac that they were trying to get back at me. But but I reject that theory out of hand for obvious reasons. I, I also in doing research for I think it's it's easy to look at Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet as a slam dunk now because, I mean, they are still like the biggest stars in the entire world. It wasn't until I did the research for this interview that I realized that it was actually kind of risky basing the film, this massive, like yeah. Yeah. huge budget film on them because you were kind of doing it based on the on your reputation, the special effects, because they weren't right. they weren't who they are now. No, they, well, I don't think they sold tickets then. Le Leonardo got, after we were making the film, in the middle of the film, I remember Romeo and Juliet came out. We're about halfway through the shoot. Yeah. And it was a hit. And all of a sudden, Leo was, was bankable at, so, at some level, the Baz Luhrmann film, right? Uh, but when we cast him, he wasn't. He'd only done, you know, Gilbert Grape and Basketball Diaries and stuff like that that was, you know, he was like the this, this, this skinny, afflicted kid. Seriously. I mean, he, he, you can, in fact, when, when I, 
Leo didn't want to read, but when I finally convinced him to read, I saw something amazing and I knew he could play Jack. And I called up the studio and I said, I found Jack. And I was talking to the head of the studio at the, at the time, Fox. And, um, and uh, I, said, I said, Leonardo DiCaprio. And he said, what? Based on what? I said, well, you haven't seen it. And he said, well, did you tape the audition? I, I said, no, he, he wouldn't let me. Uh, so you're just going to have to take my word for it. So they had to make a deal with Leo based based on my say so that I had seen something. Who did they want? Anybody but Leo. Yeah. You know, a, a star, a name. Kate too. I mean, Kate wasn't well known. Like, I, it, 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 no, Kate. Kate didn't sell tickets. She'd done a number of kind of period pieces, and and you know, she was she was well respected as an, an uh, you know a, a young up and comer. She was nineteen. She wasn't. Um, first of all, nobody at nineteen or twenty is really a movie star. They only have the potential to be, but they, they they're on a career trajectory that's that's plottable. You know like uh, Timothée Chalamet now, yeah. you know, it's like he, you, you could see him on a trajectory toward, toward massive stardom. Yeah. Leo wasn't on that trajectory yet at yeah. that point. I love, know? I love that I can tell you're Canadian because you get his name right in French, by the way. <laughs> Everyone calls him <laughs> Timothy Chalamet, except for the Canadians who know his name is Timothée Chalamet. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Can you tell me the yeah. story I heard about Kate one time and I, I, I really loved it and I can relate to it again as an East Coaster because it, the sun never shines and it's always foggy where I'm from. Just yeah, right, the story, right. like the very famous story where they're at the, the very famous scene where they're at the bow of the boat and they, and they, and they kiss and so the right. sun, the sun is setting in the background. Like that, that was, that was almost impossible to get, right? We tried for 10 days to get that shot. And what we did was, cause we were down in Baja and the sun would just kind of go, you know, a bald blue sky and the sun would go to the horizon and wink out. That was pretty much it. There was no beautiful sunset. Um, and uh, so the idea was we scheduled it for the first day of day exteriors. And if we were, looked like we were gonna have a good sunset, we'd all move to the bow. First day goes by, second, third, we get to day 10. We're on, we're on our second to last day of day exteriors. And it's kind of cloudy. And I say to the DP, I think we're going to get a sunset. And he looks through his loop and goes, no. Nope. And, the, and the, uh, the gaffer looks through his loop, no, nope, we're not going to get a sunset. And I'm like, guys, just be ready, just in case. And part, part of that is the desperation of like we're out of time. And sure enough, that, that the sun started to come down below those clouds. And you got that really kind of moody, kind of mystical red and orange with the big glowering clouds up ahead. So it wasn't a beautiful kind of Montana or Wyoming sunset. It was a, it was a moodier one, but there was something incredibly beautiful about it. And we ran like hell to the bow of the ship and we set it up really quickly and we had no time. We had 10 minutes maybe at the most. And Kate had to run and switch dresses really quickly. And she comes huffing in and climbs up the ladder to the, to the bow set and Leon, Leon, uh, Leonardo's there. And she looks at the sunset and she looks over at me in the camera crane and she screams at the top of her lungs, shoot, <laughs> which normally is my job. <laughs> so I was like, oh, OK, roll, 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 like she said. And we got two takes and one's out of focus uh, completely because we didn't never had time to rehearse and the light level had dropped way down. And the other one actually in the movie is out of focus for the first three or four seconds and pops into focus. Oh, if you watch wow. It. Because, because it's an easy way of getting people to go watch the film again. You can see it. Out of focus. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, I was, it was fun to talk to you at the beginning a little bit about this being a Canadian film. I mean, of course you're, you're a Canadian filmmaker born in Kappa's casing, I think, and then raised in Chippewa. Uh, right, right. So pretty far North. Yeah. Way up in Northern Ontario, you know, just not far from the Arctic circle, Kappa's casing. And, and then uh, grew up in Chippewa, which is now part of Niagara Falls, way down in the peninsula, right? So, yeah, yeah, Canadian born and bred, moved to Los Angeles when I was 17. Anything, now, I don't know if you'll have an answer for this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Anything Canadian about you as a filmmaker? Well, look, I think you've got a sensibility. I think you've got a value system, you know, as a Canadian, which... Um, I, it's almost impossible to quantify, but I wouldn't be who I am if I hadn't grown up in that setting, which was blue collar. So I like blue collar heroes. You know, I mean, my dad was an engineer, but it was basically kind of a blue collar neighborhood. It was a, the idea that I could go to Hollywood and become a filmmaker, let alone at, you know, any, any level since then, but just to actually make a movie would have been so unfathomable 
to me or anyone in that milieu. So I think ultimately there's always that sort of pinch me sense that somebody's going to come up and tap me on the shoulder and say, hey, get out of here. You're not supposed to be here, you know. But I think a humility before the before the craft and yeah. before the task and having that work ethic does pay off, you know. Um, I can't – I don't know how much of that is genetically innate, how much of that is upbringing, nature versus nurture. You know, it's it's a hard thing to parse out. But Canadians do punch above their weight, generally yeah. speaking, in the, in the world, much like New Zealanders. You know, I live now in, in New Zealand and I see a lot of similarities in the – value system and and uh just how how they look at life in both places it's funny you mentioned like hardworking determination i when i think about you i mean you get talked a lot about in terms of uh, of ambition like someone who was willing to like you know get the studio to build a brand new set for you know titanic right. at a considerable expense you know famously like wait for the technology to be invented so you can make the new avatar movie or invent it yourself to make the new the new avatar movie but i think yeah. i think they missed something there like i i, I don't think it's just ambition. I think it's patience and yeah. ambition. Like you yeah. have to be patient and ambitious. Well, I think it's good to be to have lofty goals for one thing. I think that I've always tried to I've always said to everybody, look, I'm going to set I'm going to set a goal here. And we're going to fail. We won't achieve that goal, but we're going to fail to a level that's above everybody else's goals. And I've always approached life that way. Say that again. Say mind- that again. I'm going to set a goal that's so ludicrously high yeah. that in trying to achieve it and failing, we will fail above everybody else's goals. Oh, that's lovely. Well, that's just how I do things, right? Yeah. But it's not ambition for its own sake. We didn't build a studio in Baja because we wanted to build a studio in Baja and, hey, look at us. Yeah. It was problem solving. It's how do we solve a problem where we need to build these huge sets we need access to a labor pool. We need access to thousands of extras and so on. To try to do it in Los Angeles would have cost twice as much. So we did it in Baja, yeah. just as one would go to England or go to Hungary or whatever solution. I mean, back back in those days as a filmmaker, and it's probably still true to a large extent, you got to be willing to live like a gypsy, just be on the road, go wherever it's possible to make, make your film. So it's problem solving. Yeah. But it's patience too. I mean, that's it. To wait yeah, for technology patience. to be so made, you know, to, to wait for that. It's the long game. Yeah, it's the long game, right? So, so I wrote uh, an eighty-page treatment for for Avatar, the first film, and I took it to my guys at Digital Domain because I had founded a, a, a an all digital uh, VFX company, and I wanted to to push them to the next level. Uh, and they said, "This isn't the next level. This is three levels." And I said, "Fine." I stuck it in a drawer and I waited. You know, and I waited when I saw Peter Jackson's second Lord of the Rings film and I saw some of the scenes with Gollum. I thought, I think we're on the cusp of being able to do Avatar. So I got it back out and I read it. And I went, oh, okay, pretty good story. Let's do it. That, that, I mean, that still blows my mind. Let me, um, are you ever unsure of yourself? <laughs> Always. Are, are, you're unsure Always. of yourself? You are? Un- uncertainty makes you stronger, right? Because uncertainty, uncer- it's not self-doubt because I know what I can do. But uncertainty about the decisions that I'm about to make or the decisions that I've already made that I now have to live up to, I think it makes you better, you know, because then what I do is I'll obsessively loop on what can go wrong, right? What are we not seeing? How can I parallel process to get to a goal? When I hit an obstacle, what's my other path around to get to that goal? What are the possible obstacles? And I've found that that kind of mental paradigm works beautifully for production where you can never foresee everything. It also works beautifully for deep ocean expedition projects because you can never foresee everything. Oh, and by the way, the ocean didn't read the script (laughs) and the the creatures don't observe their call time, you know? So anyway, it, it, I think it creates a kind of an agility and a fluidity and a, and a, and a rigor and discipline about thinking through problems ahead of time so that you're, you're not thwarted so that you're not, stopped cold in your tracks. And I've found that it works very well in engineering projects, expedition projects, and and movie projects. I just want to tell you before you go, like, Titanic is a generational movie kind of for my generation. And I just want to thank you. Thank you for it. Like, you know, it's... it's, Thank you. Thank you for the the kind of gift of it. I appreciate that very much. And this has actually been a great talk. You're you're getting me to think about a lot of things I didn't think I was going to have to be thinking about today. I'm just trying to earn a couple of bucks up here. You know what the exchange rate's like. (laughs) Hey, me too. (laughs) (laughs) James, uh, James, lovely to meet you.
Okay, good talking to you. Thank Let's you so much. Let's do it again. Yeah, looking forward to All it. Right.